Salutations Victorians and welcome to January monthly update video for Victoria 3. My name is Maciej, I'm a part of community team for Victoria 3 and this month we'll put warfare behind us and look forward to peace and progress. First off, peace deals. When war begins between two nations, a new tab will become available for them to interact with. This will be the peace deal screen where nations can view the war goals, the participating members, and who the heads of the other side are. War support is a country's willingness to continue the war. War support will slowly drop from 100 due to various factors. Whether these factors be battles lost, the amount of casualties sustained during the war, or the amount of land lost, it'll slowly start ticking down until it hits that negative 100. Once a nation gets to negative 100, they are forced to capitulate. If a country who's capitulated has any war goals against them, they will be automatically enforced whether these be simple war reparations, ceding of land to the other side, or forcing a change in government structure. Just because a war leader capitulates in the war doesn't necessarily mean that that war is over. Everyone that still has a war goal targeting them is still involved in that war. Even nations that don't necessarily have war goals can still participate until they either capitulate or sign a peace deal. Negotiated peace is an agreed upon settlement between multiple nations involved within a war. Nations will be able to select certain war goals from both sides in a attempt to kind of find a balance or an equal peace, where both sides can say, we won the war, but we still kind of lost. Let's imagine a war between Russia and Britain. Both sides know they're probably not gonna win this war one way or the other. So Russia proposes a settlement with the English in a peace deal. They will release an independent Polish state. In, in return, the English will release one of their colonies in Canada. During the peace deals, countries can be split into two main categories war leaders and negotiators. There are also non-negotiators, but they are more participants in the war and not necessarily the peace deal. They are there because they want to support a side, they're not necessarily getting anything out of it. War leaders, as the main participants in the war, are the ones who choose and set the peace deals. They can decide which war goals from both sides seem fair and reasonable, and then send the proposal forward. After the peace deal is put forward, the other war leader and all the negotiators will need to ratify this peace deal in order for the war to end and all demands to be met. Be careful when at war though. A quick end to the war with an unfavorable treaty may be more desirable for players than a revolution brewing at home. Peace is the way forward, but so is our next topic. Let's take a closer look at technology. What is technology in this game? It is uh, one of the sort of systems that tick on in the background that helps you shape your country into what you want it to be and how you want it to look, how you want it to function. The technology trees are divided into three like sections. Uh, there's the production tree, there's the military tree, and then there's the last one, which is the society uh, tree. The first tree is the production tree, and it's where most of your economic techs are. Uh, we have things like the, the steam engine, and uh, that unlocks railroads, and we have electricity in there uh, that unlocks new goods and new buildings, and other, other exciting ones that unlock production methods, etc. It's mainly to make your industry uh, more productive or, or a different, have different type, types of workforces and, and stuff like that. And then there's a military one. Uh, and that's where you find all the, uh, the new cool uh, types of um, military equipment. For instance, we have the dreadnoughts and you have tanks um, and uh, aeroplanes, submarines. There's several of those. And then there's also the more progressive improvements uh, into like field hospitals and uh, other uh, military-based things. Breach load rifles and Gatling guns. Like there's a lot of exciting things in the, in, in the military tree. So why would you want to spend uh, your hard-earned innovation in the military tree? Well, obviously you want to have a great army in order to show the world how great you are as a nation uh, so that you can push your weight around and fle really flex those muscles. The society tree is where all the ideas that um, help you shape your, your country internally, mostly, uh, are um, located. Uh, there we have things like pan-nationalism uh, that unlocks uh, new formable countries like Yugoslavia, or we have nationalism that unlocks Germany, for instance. And uh, we also have uh, 
texts that unlock new uh, laws and institutions. For instance, we have socialism and anarchism that unlocks uh, um, laws related to those ideologies. The rate uh, that technologies can be researched is based upon innovation. And innovation itself is a system that's influenced by several factors. You can build up innovation through uh, your universities and their output. It's also influenced just by the literacy of your population. If only 10% of your nation can read and write, you're not gonna be able to invent as much as a country where 90% of the country is literate. Um, you can also have your innovation and your ability to invent things influenced by uh, your interest groups. Your industrialists, your, your armed forces, your intelligentsia, all three of them have different ways where if they're happy with you, they can help out with some research. Technology is organized into five eras, uh, starting all the way from the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution up until the early middle part of the 20th century. Uh, as you progress, you start from the very fundamental early elements of railroads, for example, up through modern electrical design and the advent of, well, approaching the World War II, II era, almost. Uh, you can't speed run your way straight to a very specific technology. You want an era five if you're otherwise just an era one. If you try to forge ahead too much and focus too much on one thing, all your other research is going to be lagging behind. You're going to encounter more and more roadblocks on your way to really trying to laser focus on this very specific technology that's otherwise quite far in the future for you. Even if you decide to not look up what Karl Marx has been writing in some specific book, somebody else is going to eventually find out what this whole socialism thing is and start spreading it to your country as well. And the same applies for your good old-fashioned regular material inventions as well. Even if you don't look up what a machine gun is, somebody is going to start importing them. Somebody is going to start learning what the designs are. Eventually, you will learn what a machine gun is, even if you don't actively research it yourself. Now, let's talk about another thing that is very important for all the countries, flux. In Victoria III, all flags represent countries. They're simple, well, simple or not so simple designs that represent the visual shorthand of what a country is. Uh, you have your basic tricolor of France. You can have an elaborate uh, coat of arms emblazoned upon it because you're some fancy monarchy. There are all sorts of different flags out there. These flags are also influenced by your ideology, uh, your culture. They can change over the course of the game. You're not stuck with one design. In fact, if you're the United States, you can just even get more stars as you get more states. It's a grand old flag. Um, of course, it's also been a challenge trying to come up with all these designs. Not every country has a straightforward single flag for us to pick on. Uh, Russia, for example, uh, didn't have a single state flag until the 1850s. They had a uh, flag for their ships. They had another flag for their ships. They had a flag for their navy, they had a flag for, for the dynasty, they had all sorts of things. So you have to narrow down from that and say, well, this flag makes sense in this context. If the country becomes more like this, well, maybe this flag will work a bit more. And then, thankfully, historically, Russia did come up with a state flag, and we can have that appear later on in the game as well. Flags can also be a bit more dynamic. We don't always have a design for every country. Some countries just didn't have a flag design at all. There's other cases where countries can just appear and we can't really predict what their flag would be anyways. So we have a system based upon, again, ideology, culture, religion, and other factors that uh, can create new, unique flag designs for dynamic countries. Flags can also be influenced by uh, their diplomatic relations with another country. Say, for example, you're Spain and you've had a real rough time in the 19th century and Britain over there has decided Gibraltar is not enough and they want all of Spain for themselves. And they puppet you. Well, your flag can actually change based on that. You can have your own coat of arms still preserved in the corner there, but remember, big old John Bull over there is now in charge. So now you have the Union Jack cantoned in the upper left corner. Modding more flags into the game is a fairly straightforward process. You have uh, some basic text files that you can edit to create more flags, and you can just 
pick from the library of uh, graphical elements that we already have in the game, or add more elements in if you want. And referencing those elements, you can script just in plain text files uh, together a new design saying, you know, I want uh, this diagonal stripe to be placed here. Make sure it's orange color on top of a white field and then add a blue star off in the corner because that looks neat. And script that all together in a single entry, reference that in a flag definitions file, a second entry, and that's it. Your flag should be appearing in the game now, if you scripted everything right. These flags that you design can be triggered under very specific and oddball circumstances. Much like our historical flags that we've added in, you can have these custom flags triggered by the, the year, whether you're at war, your ideology, your culture, who's in charge of the country, wh what region of the earth you're on. There's a crazy amount of triggers, and you can combine them together too to make sure that this flag appears in whatever circumstance that you want. We reached the end of this monthly update video, but we'll be back next month with more news and updates from the game developers. Until then, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, join us on Discord, and subscribe to our newsletter to stay up to date with all things Victoria.